Xavier Renegade Angel is a very strange show. Running for only two seasons on Adult Swim starting in 2007, the show managed to be a whole lot of things within the span of only 20 episodes. If most comedies adopt the Spinal Tap mindset of there's a fine line between stupid and clever, Xavier was a show that instead adopted the mindset that there is no difference between stupid and clever. As such, the show ended up being, on its surface, not much more than offensive and crude humor and silly wordplay. Even if the show had no value beyond this, I would still recommend the show for humor alone. To this day, it's the only comedy show that can consistently make me laugh every time I watch it, and for good reason. The show is sort of an endless blitz of joke after joke after joke, meaning that if any one joke fails, the overarching bulk of humor allows it to maintain consistency. Despite this, I don't really think that almost any of the funny moments of the show fall flat, and it really is a case of quantity meets quality here. However, despite all of this, the show is more than just dumb jokes. When discussing comedies like this, I like to use the phrase, dumb characters, smart writers, and I think this mentality especially applies to Xavier. The show is a mix of dumb comedy and actually pretty well done satire. The show uses references, easter eggs, irony, non-linearity, and postmodernism in order to convey various themes. The themes are ultimately in service of the comedy, and so while I wouldn't claim the show makes some grand statement, it still definitively has something to say. I'd like to discuss these themes throughout the show, as well as individual themes and observations and episodes, and try to tie these all into how Xavier uses satire to make several points about various topics, even when doing so in the service of grown-worthy sex puns. So let's begin. The main character of the show is Xavier. On the surface, Xavier's character seems to be a reference to Native American spirituality, with Xavier's look seeming to imply interconnectedness with all of life, his body being composed of several different animal parts and traits, having backwards legs, brown fur, a beak for a nose, six nipples, and a snake for a hand. He spends his days drifting across the desert in what appears to be the American Southwest. He makes references to Native American spirituality, and he presents himself as a shaman-like figure. Beyond the surface, though, Xavier's character is a bit more than that. He's not a satire of Native Americans. He's a satire of the New Age movement. I like to joke that the show is about white guys with dreadlocks. In short, Xavier's character is meant to be not a Native American himself, but co-opting spirituality and ideologies from various religions and belief systems and combining them into an incoherent mess of all religion. In this sense, the show is not critiquing the ideologies of spirituality to their core, so much as the misunderstood appropriation of spiritual beliefs into a form of benevolent narcissism. Xavier's character is not a good person, and for precisely this reason. He seems to adopt varying spiritual, political, and moral principles and beliefs at will, without even bothering to really understand them first, in order to suit a narcissistic end goal of helping people. In the episode, Blood Corn, there's a joke in which Xavier literally starts to masturbate at the thought of helping people, which says more than I could about Xavier's mentality. The show's main thesis on Xavier is that his ideology is incoherent and corrupt, and this is presented through the way that every episode goes. Each episode is about Xavier walking into a town, finding someone in need, and then proceeding to help them with their troubles. Having felt like he's successfully done his good deed, he then drifts out of town to find more people to help. However, each time it leads to misery for the people he's helped, as well as massive numbers of people dying and by the second season, all of existence repeatedly collapsing in on itself. Xavier seems to believe his goodwill is more than enough to justify his mission of helping people, and the show portrays this as destructive to everyone except himself. In a sense, you can see anything that Xavier does as a satirical middle finger at people who use spiritual beliefs without understanding them to quote-unquote help people, framing this need to help without understanding as masturbatory and destructive. Xavier himself is sort of an amalgamation of various spiritual ideas. He is himself a quote-unquote bastard child, and I think it's fitting that his look, his ideology, and his actions all seem to reflect a bastardization of various spiritual and philosophical ideas. A friend once pointed out to me that the irony of Xavier's legs being backwards is that no matter how far he goes, he's always moving in reverse. 
I thought this was a funny metaphor for Xavier on the whole. Constantly regressing, but seeing it as progression. Following from this, the series emblem carries this theme of blending different philosophies together. The emblem appears to be a combination of a dream catcher, an eye, a yin yang, and an infinity symbol. All things which vaguely allude to some sort of deeper meaning, but don't actually provide any substance when just sort of mashed together into a single image. In the 10th episode, Shakashuri Blowdown, it's revealed that Xavier's penis is a peen eye, a third eye conveniently placed on his crotch. To me, this is hilarious because it's a play on the concept of a third eye, a spiritual symbol relating to wisdom and enlightenment. Making his third eye his penis could be saying many things, but I like to think of it as being a jab at New Age, comparing their conception of a third eye and their misunderstood notions of enlightenment to masturbation, making the reveal of the peni from the two Xavers in the episode kind of a dick measuring contest of spirituality. In this case, stupid is clever. A lot of episodes begin with Xavier drifting out in the desert, where he shares a monologue that lays down the theme of the episode in some way. These scenes of Xavier walking alone in the desert very clearly take place inside of Xavier's head, because in the very first episode, he goes from out in the middle of the desert to Connecticut of all places. I always interpreted these scenes of the desert as being sort of a metaphor for his mind, or at the least, a nice look into his psyche. The desert opening is itself supposed to be a reference to the old TV show Kung Fu, with Xavier's self-image being that of a benevolent lone drifter. The show's name, Xavier Renegade Angel, itself shares this theme, where he's an angel on the renegade, both an outlaw and a force for good. On top of this, the desert brings to mind a degree of Native American history, with the Apache and Navajo tribes living in the deserts of the American Southwest, among others, and I imagine that Xavier's self-image is sort of combining the Native American shaman and kung fu TV show intro together. Even though in the first episode it's revealed that he's really just walking through the streets of a small town in Connecticut, in his mind, he's a lone wolf drifting through the southwest looking for a hand in need of help. The reason why I think of the desert in the show as a metaphor for Xavier's mind is that when he gets violently snapped out of the image of himself in the desert by a bottle to his face, it sort of reveals that he was stuck in his own mind with this image of himself in a desert. As such, I like to think of it as his own little space inside his head. I think that it might possibly be a subtle joke on the part of the creators that his head space is the desert, vast, but, em but completely empty. In a sense, the desert serves as a visual joke about Xavier's empty-headedness. Xavier is sort of the center of the show, and every episode involves him going on some journey of self-discovery and benevolence that ends with the destruction of the lives of others. The major theme of the show is that Xavier is a narcissist, whose benevolence is self-serving and ignorant, and his perception of himself as deep and a force for good ends up ironically proving himself to be the opposite. This is used as a sort of commentary on the kinds of people that Xavier represents. People whose ego gets in the way of their intention, particularly when that ego co-opts spiritual and philosophical ideals in order to maintain itself at the expense of those around them. In a sense, the stereotypical white liberal. From here, it's really just a matter of discussing individual episodes and how the episodes play into a bigger picture. So I'm going to go ahead and discuss the episodes one by one and the individual themes in each episode, as well as how the episodes themselves demonstrate the overarching themes of the show. In the first episode, Xavier is trying to answer the question, what doth life? Which is really just a silly way of saying, what is the meaning of life? The episode is extensively about this question, and more importantly, the futility of asking such a supposedly deep existential question. This idea was shared in the DVD fanmentary, so I don't want to take credit for it, but in the fanmentary, the commentator explains that in the episode, Xavier asking about the meaning of life to a computer causes the computer to get stuck in a loop. The computers then all get infected with a virus, which Xavier responds to by telling the people of the town to dump the computers in the lake. This causes the drinking water to infect the humans with the computer virus, and they all start to get stuck in a loop. The fan commentator explains this as being representative about the search for the meaning to life. 
trying to search for the meaning of life causes people to get stuck in a loop repetitively, endlessly. The implication would then be that the search for meaning in life, trying to find these deeper existential answers, is almost useless because you'll get stuck running in circles, completely incapable of finding any answers of substance. Fairly enough, the episode ends with Xavier having ruined the entire town without finding a single shred of an answer as to what life really means. Additionally, the question is also poorly framed. In the show, what doth life is a means of implying the idiocy of the question. By framing the question in such nonsense terms, it causes the computer to go haywire. This whole bit also reminds me of the 42-bit in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, in that the irony of the answer to life, the universe, and everything being 42 is that they never actually phrased it in the form of a question. In both cases, they're pointing out the meaninglessness of whatever answer you find when asking such a poorly framed non-question. This may just be my interpretation, but I always felt as though the first episode of Xavier was setting the tone for the series as an exercise in philosophical futility, and tackled the biggest and arguably most useless existential question ever first, before getting to anything more specific. This is just my opinion, but asking for the meaning of life is pointless, because meaning, as far as I'm concerned, is a construct of language. Life is nebulously defined at best, and searching for meaning in a vague conception of reality, I think, keeps the entire conversation locked down to a very humanistic way of viewing reality. It doesn't actually matter what life means, and searching for endlessly for the answer will get you nowhere, but it's also just categorically irrelevant. Art can mean something, lyrics can mean something, Thing. conversations can mean something, but life in the abstract is just not something that meaning can apply to. Though there are certainly individual things that you can derive meaning from in life, although I'd argue those are often confirmation bias. None of this is particularly what Xavier is stating, but Xavier does seem to be suggesting that the question is itself meaningless, and so finding meaning in the answer isn't likely to happen. There are some loosely connected ideas in the episode that are mostly throwaway jokes. The idea that AIDS and crack were both invented by the military is mocking conspiracy theories. When Xavier says, powers are for the weak, I have no powers, that's, I think, a cute little prodding at New Age spirituality. When he says, I'm a survivor, we're a dying breed, that, I think, is one of the most brilliant lines ever. When Xavier tells them to dump the computers in the lake in order to not soil their precious land, that's a prime example of irony, in that it's a very anti-environmental action framed as being pro-environment, and is also an example of Xavier's bastardization of spirituality. If his goal is to value the earth, he's failed to actually do so. At the end, there's a man in a red corvette who shows Xavier his penis, and I think this is playing on the cliché of a man having a midlife crisis, who buys an expensive sports car to make up for his insecurities about sex. Funnily enough, I read an article about how when men see sports cars, it causes their testosterone levels to rise because they associate it with masculinity. There doesn't seem to be a point to this guy at the end, but there is possibly a similarity between him and Xavier, given the self-serving ego trip, perhaps likening Xavier's spiritual quest to buying a sports car in order to cover up sexual inadequacy. The second episode, Chief Beef Loco, immediately establishes another irony to Xavier, his emphasis on the universal oneness of all life. In the first scene, he saves a mosquito's life because he values all life, and then the mosquito immediately goes on to kill two guys who are harassing Xavier. In saving life, he inadvertently kills two men. These things happen, I guess, but it sort of undermines the idea that by helping the mosquito, he's in some way helping these two men. It makes the universal oneness of all life bit sound a little off. In his second opening monologue for the episode, there's also an irony that exposes Xavier's fundamental lack of self-awareness. Wherever there is suffering, suffering, I was there. Wherever there is injustice, I was I, there. I, and wherever there is crying, I'm right here. He's trying to make a point about his benevolence, that he goes and he finds the people who need his help and he helps them. But by framing it all in past tense, it implies that Xavier was there before the injustice and suffering happened, and furthermore that he himself caused the injustice and suffering. His inability to recognize his effect on others is a major theme of the show itself, and this scene very quickly establishes Xavier's tendencies towards narcissism. He believes he's helping, but he repeatedly demonstrates that he isn't. <laughs> 
The main plot of the episode involves Xavier helping Percy deal with some bullies, which causes Xavier to join a Mexican gang, at which point he becomes their new leader and tries to get them to quit being a violent, drug-pushing gang. There's two or three points about the, this main plot that I'd like to bring up. First is that it demonstrates the same irony from before. The Mexican gang are recognizably violent and malicious, and yet Xavier goes to help by helping the bullies, more so than helping Percy, the person who he was there to help in the first place. His valuing of all life includes valuing people who are apparently irredeemable. Of course, it's hard not to recognize a very racist slant to this episode on the surface. And while the gang is portrayed in a hyper-stereotyped manner to the point of being a satire of racist stereotypes, that alone isn't enough for the show to be saying anything about race. This is where two concepts come in that are related and have similar names. The White Savior and the Savior Complex. For those who don't know, the White Savior is a trope often featured in movies where a white person helps people of color. It plays off the implication that people of color are somehow in need of white people's help in order to civilize them and turn them into respectable, proper citizens. The term is critiquing art, often written by white people, that portrays white people as the saviors of people of color, helping them become respectable and reach their true potential, with said potential being framed in very white-centric terms. The trope is seen as narcissistic and implicitly racist, and while Xavier isn't canonically portrayed as white until the very, very end of the series, this episode does satirize the whole white savior trope by having Xavier approach a gang of unruly Mexican men in order to turn them around into better people. And as for Savior Complex, it's very clear that Xavier has a Savior Complex throughout the entire series. And what I find to be a particularly funny visual joke of sorts is when he joins the gang and is made their leader. The current leader takes his tattoo off and puts it on Xavier's head, the tattoo being a crown of thorns. Here is Xavier with a literal crown of thorns on his head, perceiving himself as the savior of these Mexican gang members, demonstrating a height of narcissism that can only be topped by... Well, just about any other scene in this show. So in a sense, the racist portrayal of this Mexican gang is really just poking fun at the white savior trope. And as such, the Mexican gang is a satire of the way that white people view Mexicans, particularly the kinds of people who write white savior plots and new age types who have an unintentionally racist savior complex about themselves. There are some other fun jokes throughout the episode, but one of my favorite jokes in the entire series is when they're fighting the gang lord Shiny, and the mosquito beast throws Shiny into the lava, and Shiny says, I accept Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal savior! Yes, made it! Boy. This joke is poking fun at certain sects of Protestant Christianity, who believe that if you accept Jesus into your heart before death, that's your way into heaven. So in a sense, this is making fun of the deathbed conversion idea, and taking it to a sort of silly conclusion, that if you can game the system, you can be the most reprehensible person in life and still go to heaven as long as you convert before it's too late. The episode ends with Xavier rambling on, and his progress with the gang immediately being undone by Shining killing them all. Again, Xavier's desire to help others is self-serving and destructive. The opening monologue of episode 3 talks about the heart, and connects the heart to God, but also to violence. These three things form the bulk of what the episode is about. Life, God, violence, and the connection between them. The irony of the opening monologue is that by framing God's virtuous gift of life in such a violent way, referring to beatings and kicking an angel in the face, he inadvertently highlights both a dark undertone of religion and God as propagators of violence, and also inadvertently calls attention to the expendability of life. The main plot of the episode is about Robbie, a boy in a wheelchair, and his father, a Christian scientist who heals with the power of prayer. Robbie is a scientist who uses science in order to trick his father into believing that his spiritual powers are real, and then Robbie creates life out of inert chemicals. Xavier gets upset and tells his father that Robbie is lying to him. Already, the connections between life and God are made. Robbie's dad is a faith healer, using God to save people's lives. After Xavier discovers that Robbie was literally pulling strings behind the scenes, Robbie becomes the first person to create life. 
From there, the themes of violence become more relevant, as Robbie's dad commits suicide after he discovers that life is meaningless, because his faith was taken from him. Death by fire causes him to fuse with the life that Robbie created, which combines to form the Eversplosion, a literal fusing of life and violence. The Eversplosion ravages the town chasing Xavier until Robbie comes to stop the Eversplosion, and he tells it that he now believes in God because he, he himself is God, having created a life. He then stabs the ever explosion with a cross that conceals a knife. The cross turned dagger also highlights the relationship between God and violence. Ultimately, the episode isn't wholly anti-Christian. The implication seems to be that Ravi's dad has a good relationship with religion, even though his religion isn't true. He's seen as respectable, and has a reason to live based on his relationship with God. God, in a sense, gives him life, and he, in return, supposedly saves the lives of others as well. The episode does, of course, demonstrate that faith is not healing anybody, and is more akin to a placebo, with the actual work being done by science. But it's the fact that Xavier exposes this lie that causes the plot to move towards destruction. Although in the first episode, the show demonstrates the futility of searching for meaning in life, this episode almost seems to imply that those who have found meaning are better off believing in a false meaning than being forcibly removed from their understanding of life in order to appeal to the narcissism of the person who shatters said worldview. Xavier is sort of pan-spiritual, seemingly believing all religions simultaneously. And so, in a sense, Xavier's appeals away from Christianity could be self-serving towards his own bastardized pan-spiritual worldview, wanting to deprive someone who has found worth in a form of spirituality that is not his own, under the assumption that his own pan-spiritual worldview is innately better, more accurate, or more benevolent. Again, Xavier's narcissism is the downfall not of himself, but of those around him. The overarching theme of the episode might be pointing to the violent implications of Xavier's spiritual beliefs. That Xavier's tendency towards destroying the lives of others manifests in his quest for spiritual enlightenment, an utter failure to actually understand both spirituality and the needs of others. Adding to the irony of Xavier's supposed valuing of all life, he makes a number of ableist comments towards Robbie throughout the course of the episode. Similar to the white savior aspects of the previous episode, Xavier's treatment of Robbie points to the irony of valuing all life, which is that even as Xavier sees himself as valuing Robbie's life, he plays into ableist notions of value on life, that Robbie is somehow lesser for being disabled, even despite being a genius and a much better person than Xavier in just about every way. So, in a sense, Xavier's philosophy of the universal oneness of all life is contradicted by his openly othering look towards Robbie. Drawing just a bit from personal experience, this reminds me of allies, people who align themselves with the cause that they don't have personal experience in, such as when a straight person aligns themselves with LGBTQ rights and activism, or in this case, an able-bodied person aligning themselves with the needs of a disabled person. Allies are often useful, but there's a common conception that some allies align themselves with the cause only for the praise, and don't actually care about the people who they claim to be allies for. It's a sort of condescending, I scratch your back, you scratch mine mentality that generates a false, mean-spirited sense of superiority over the people that they think they're being gracious to, when in reality, they're honestly not that much better than just being plain bigots. Throughout this episode, Xavier embodies this conception by repeatedly making it clear that he thinks of Robbie as lesser, in need of his help because, without Xavier, Robbie is hopeless because of his disability. This, I think, gets to another facet of the themes of the show, that Xavier's narcissistic appeals towards helping people is not just masturbatory and ignorant, but almost a bit hateful, or at least hypocritical in a mean-spirited way. Xavier doesn't just think that people need his help because they're people who deserve better, but also because he thinks that they're lesser without him. That without his guidance and goodwill, it would be lost. Or to quote Xavier directly, I'll never apologize for defending the weak, the meek, and the useless. There are a few jokes that hammer home the main theme of the episode, as well as some jokes that are just clever in their own way. At one point, Xavier says, I'd like to see this guy pray in abortion. And this, I think, plays on the relationship between God, life, and violence. Abortion laws are, of course, a huge source of contention among right-wing Christianity, and there's almost a sort of irreverence to life when Xavier trivializes abortion that way. 
Later, when the explosion goes off, people start to immediately capitalize on the novelty of an explosion that doesn't end, including one person who uses it to support what appears to be an anti-abortion agenda, with a sign that reads, Why don't we explode abortion laws? Abortion's ongoing political debate is centered very much around these three themes, God, life, and violence. The value of life is put on the table, and God is used to appeal to a pro-life sense of what constitutes a life and thus has value. To use an explosion as a means of protesting abortion laws plays a bit, I think, into how people use violence to generate an emotional response. Right-wing Christianity has an almost absurd view on the nature between these three things, where violence is valued as being in the name of God, but simultaneously, life is valued as being God's creation. As such, it's almost contradictory to value both life and violence, but not altogether uncommon among certain subgroups of Christianity. The opening monologue of episode 4 sets up two major themes, the theme of fate and destiny, and also the theme of the phoenix. This episode is a more straightforward comedy episode, less satirical, so there's not much I can say. I will say that the episode has a repetition of things dying and being reborn, such as Chief Master Guru asking Xavier to put baby birds into a fire so they can be reborn, and the seven children that Xavier eats being reborn into the Everchild, and then the Everchild being reborn again into Xavier. Given that the Phoenix story is one in which death leads to rebirth, the references to the Phoenix all throughout the episode, including having the episode take place in Phoenix, Arizona, the episode reminds me a bit of the first episode in which the characters all got caught in a loop. The looping death and rebirth various times throughout episode 4 I think can tie into the themes of fate, that there's this endless process of being born, dying, and being reborn, a self-regurgitating mess. In this sense, I think the theme is fitting for Xavier, who is caught in an endless loop of drifting into various towns and failing to learn anything from his experiences or better himself in any way. This is evident in episode 1, where after asking the computer a supposedly deep philosophical question, he then asks the computer another supposedly deep question, having utterly failed to learn from his mistakes because of his inability to perceive his actions as mistakes. It's fitting that when he becomes reborn as a star child, the name is the Ever Child, because I think that's indicative of Xavier, a sort of joke that he's a perpetual man-baby. By extension, the episode's themes of rebirth seem like they should come with it some sort of new lesson or spiritual enlightenment or progression, but Xavier doesn't seem to learn anything from the episode, and I think that this overarching theme of constantly being regurgitated without having actually changed or developed at all is representative of a larger theme of the show itself. The opening monologue of episode 5 establishes the theme of the episode as being about the yin-yang, a balance of opposing forces. It's worth noting that, at least in part, the yin-yang represents the idea that seemingly opposing forces might actually be more complementary and more alike than they might seem. Early on, during the scene with the pet shop owner, a lot of the pets he owns are in some way a meeting of opposites, carrying the yin-yang motif, such as the funny bunny and the unfunny bunny. The main plot of the episode revolves around Xavier trying to teach a bratty, rich child how to stop being greedy and selfish. Immediately when watching this episode, I thought of the rich kid as the yin to Xavier's yang. Xavier and the kid are seemingly diametric opposites. Xavier is essentially a homeless man, a drifter who lives off the land and helps others whenever he gets the chance. The kid, on the other hand, is rich, privileged beyond belief, and entirely selfish. Again, one of the key components of the yin-yang is that seemingly opposing forces are actually not as different as they may seem, and in a sense, Xavier and the rich kid are mirrors of each other, with them both sharing the same narcissism, selfishness, and total failure to understand what it means to care for others. In the middle of the episode, there's a segment about emo dynamics that also demonstrates a bit of the yin-yang theme present throughout the episode. The emo dynamics segment argues that any act or feeling of happiness brings with it an equivalent feeling of pain or suffering somewhere else in the world, and that joy can neither be created nor destroyed, and so when someone enjoys life, it causes some sort of anguish elsewhere. This of course is nonsense, but that's the joke. It reminds me a little bit of horseshoe theory, the idea that extreme ends aren't correct and the answer is somewhere in the middle. Both horseshoe theory and emo dynamics encourage apathy because, to quote the show, happiness is murder. Caring too much, or trying to make the world a better place, is useless. 
I don't think emo dynamics was referring to the mentality of centrism, but it parallels it fairly well. Xavier convinces the rich kid to give up his ways and try to stop his father from exploiting the land, but again completely misses the point by injecting the father with Native American blood, hoping that will somehow make him understand the error of his ways. Instead, his father exploits his new Native American bloodline in order to open up a casino. This causes the Native American spirits to rise out of the grave and start killing everybody. Xavier tries to solve it by resurrecting dead cowboy spirits. The cowboys and Indians aspect of the episode carries over the motif of the yin yang, being seen as opposing forces. It also again demonstrates Xavier's fundamental misunderstanding of the philosophy he seems to believe in, seeing as how he thinks the solution to the uprising of Native American spirits is the quote-unquote re-genocide them, which goes firmly against his supposed respect for the Native Americans and for all of God's creations. Throughout the show, one of the running gags in every episode is that Xavier drifts into a town and into the lives of others with some sort of unanswered question on his mind. And through the episode, he comes to quote unquote, learn something, but ends up learning just about nothing. Given that the show is a satire of new age spirituality and the kinds of people who misunderstand and appropriate philosophical and cultural ideas to suit their own narcissism, the whole concept of each episode centering around a lesson that could have been learned, but that Xavier seems entirely incapable of learning, is I think in line with the target of the show's mockery. World of Hurt BC doesn't really have much of a monologue that establishes a theme as concretely as previous episodes, but the episode still has the same format as the previous episodes. The lesson Xavier seems to want to learn is his origin, who he is and where he came from. He finds a cave painting on the news that looks very similar to himself, so he decides to travel back in time to figure out where the painting came from. The episode goes vaguely into the psychology of Xavier as a character when he enters into the World of Hurt. The world of her is basically a land composed of Xavier's insecurities. The double that Xavier meets says that it's... This land is the physical manifestation of brute, inarticulate rage. Yeah, no doy. The episode implies that Xavier is bottling up a lot of anxieties, including his emotions and his past with his family. This does include an implication that Xavier being physically abused when he was younger contributed to how he is now, which is a little awkward, but it's mostly a throwaway joke. Either way, in the scene, we finally get a glimpse of Xavier's mom, who has, up until now, been largely absent in the series. It shows that she is a drunk, and implies that Xavier's origin is psychological more than it is spiritual. In episode 1, he is portrayed as having a Moses-like origin story, but this is another example of Xavier's self-image being somewhat narcissistic, to the point of mimicking a savior complex. When World of Hurt shows his origin being a bit more depressing, it shows that Xavier has a tendency to exalt himself to a more important and miraculous standard than his life suggests. In a sense, the world of her is somewhat blocked memories that Xavier doesn't want to believe because of his self-image as a wise shaman and the supposed renegade angel. The title itself reinforces his conception of himself as being beyond that of a normal person. Xavier sees these things in the world of her as a lie, and then proceeds to go back to his normal ways of trying to help people. He teaches a caveman how to get his frustrations out through poetry instead of violence, which appears to work for only a minute. And then Xavier draws the cave painting so he can show the caveman what it looks like, and discovers that he drew the painting. Again, he doesn't discover anything, and the moment where he gets close to learning something, he learns nothing. Part of the thing about New Age and spirituality, in general, is a quest for enlightenment. Knowledge, learning, power through the self, and through the metaphysical. As such, one of the major critiques of spirituality, and of New Age in particular, that the show presents is its failure to actually teach anything of substance. Xavier looks to spiritual answers for everything, and fails to contemplate his own psychology, and this episode does a good job of demonstrating that his motivations are perhaps more indicative of psyche than of divine inspiration, a theme that becomes increasingly prevalent throughout the series, but particularly in the final episode of the series. The opening of Bloodcorn begins with a monologue that gets interrupted. During this opening scene, Xavier is awarded for being the best guardian angel, and the scene captures the incoherence between Xavier's supposed goodwill and his effect on others. Every form of praise is immediately met with signs that his actions have ruined people's lives, including everyone dying and nobody being saved by his quote-unquote good works. 
This scene, like World of Hurt before it, does a pretty good job of capturing the fragmented psyche of Xavier as a character. Cognitive dissonance frames a lot of his benevolence as being misfired at best, with a darker element of who Xavier is lying underneath. The opening is revealed to be a dream, at which point Xavier has a monologue about dreams. Dreams are a minor theme of the episode, but the dream he has in the intro is indicative of a major theme of the show itself. During the monologue, he starts to masturbate, being turned on by the thought of helping people. Like I said earlier, this quite literally demonstrates Xavier's desire to help others as being masturbatory, and this is a major theme of the series that is made abundantly clear in the opening. The episode's main plot centers on environmentalism, the exploitation of Mother Earth by man. Early on, Xavier tunes into the wavelength of Mother Earth to see if she has dreams. He sees a dream of the Earth in her underwear in class being laughed at. This is probably a coincidence, but humorously enough, I looked up dream interpretation on the cliché in your underwear during class dream, and found that it meant that you feel that you aren't being respected. The idea that Mother Earth has a dream that implies that the Earth doesn't feel respected I think is probably incidental to the show, but it's fairly fitting. Xavier tries to prevent a factory from polluting by using his dream catcher to clog the drain. This causes the factory to shut down, costing everyone their jobs. He then decides to help one of the workers who got fired to bring rain to his crops, but fails. Out of anger, the man shoots God, which causes nature to come alive and attack everyone in town. By trying to help people, he again manages to get everything destroyed. If this is starting to sound repetitive, that's because of the TV show, and the show follows a similar format from episode to episode. Each one covers a different topic and showcases how Xavier misunderstands said topic to disastrous results. The show is, at any given moment, only semi-coherent, and so being able to piece together a firm stance that the show is taking on environmentalism is a bit difficult, but I will say that there is a running thread in episode 7 of Xavier appealing to a metaphysical reason for respecting the Earth, rather than one rooted more directly in preservation. It's possible that the show is making fun of environmentalism itself, or just particularly of religious appeals to environmentalism, or just parodying the topic without any particular direct point made about environmentalism. This one is a personal favorite of mine. The opening monologue of the episode talks about the anniversary of his father's death, and references fire, which becomes a theme of the episode. The episode has a recurring theme of fathers and fatherhood because it centers largely on Xavier's grief over his father's death. Of course, we learned back in episode one that Xavier was the person who set his house on fire, killing his parents. The main plot of the episode addresses, of all things, anarcho-punks. I really love this episode because I've spent a bit of time in local left-wing oriented music scenes and in leftist circles online and in person, and even though I love most of the people I've encountered and befriended, I can't help but feel like the episode is pretty accurate with a lot of the jokes. Xavier goes to a squatter's utopia called Squatopia, a punk anarchist commune with no rules. A lot of the jokes mock nonsense in the left wing. They decide to rename Burning Man to Burning Person in order to combat sexism, saying that Burning Man. Actually, this year we're not going to be sexist. We're calling it Burning Person. In today's day and age, women can be set on fire too. This reminds me a lot of the sort of liberal feminist ideals like women can join the military too, that don't actually help anybody but make things equal by making things worse for everyone rather than improving the situation. Xavier meets a guy named Tude, who wants to get away from the anarchist commune because he has too much freedom there and craves structure in being told what to do. This on its own is a sort of absurdist, ironic take on anarcho-punks, but the part that I always find hilarious is when Xavier says, Then go sell some of your seed. That would be a choice, fascist! Why don't you sell your seed? I just love how he calls Xavier a fascist for giving him a choice. Some people could take this as a joke at the expense of people who use the word fascist too liberally, and I can see that, but I interpret this character in general as being not so much emblematic of anarchism, but rather emblematic of people who have a, only a basic surface level understanding of anarchism. Surface level understandings of ideologies is a major theme of the series at large, with Xavier being a satirical take on the surface level understanding that New Age proponents have towards religions and cultures beyond their own. When Tude meets a slave from the 1800s who survived, Tude explains how he understands how the slave feels because he was a slave to TV and a slave to pop culture. And this is another example of a joke at the expense of the sorts of liberal mentality that thinks that things like TV and pop culture could be even remotely equivalent to actual slavery. 
There's something irreverent and ignorant about claiming to be a slave when dealing with middle-class American problems, when compared to the actual historical and contemporary examples of slave labor, and the harsh conditions that people can really be subjected to. Episode 9 deals with three things. Free will, the dichotomy between the heart and the mind, and Christianity. The conversation of free will, like the meaning of life in episode 1, is framed in episode 9 as a somewhat meaningless conversation to have. It's explicitly stated that if Xavier spends too much time contemplating the nature of free will and existence, he will drown in a tunneling sea of infinite potentiality. Which is to say that if he ponders for too long how much of what he does is free, he fails to end up doing anything at all. This conversation continues into the pivotal moment of the episode, Xavier being caught between a diverging path between the mind and the heart. This dichotomy is revealed through the episode both to be a false dichotomy and a meaningless one. Another point I think is worth noting is that the narrator explicitly refers to the path of the mind as the path on the left. This called to mind the concept of the left-hand path, a term which is used in reference to black and white magic, with the right-hand path referring to white magic and the left-hand path referring to black magic. In a sense, the left-hand path is that of evil or Satan. I'm not super brushed up on this stuff, but in a sense, it seems like left-hand path is the path away from God. And so if we run with that idea, the path away from God being the path of the mind is sort of indicative of the running theme of Christianity that we see in, see in this episode. When Xavier goes to the path of the mind, he comes across a desert town that appears to be the recent site of a massacre. This appears to be a reference to El Topo, although I can't say much about the reference because I haven't actually seen El Topo. Regardless, this appears to be what happens when someone takes the path of the mind, the destruction of others. Xavier finds what led to this massacre in the form of a nearly episode-long flashback in which a priest envisions his possible path if he has sex with a gorilla that knows sign language. Throughout this extremely convoluted flashback, we see a stream of various points being made about Christianity. The main plot of the flashback centers around a gorilla named Popo who moves people with their sign language. The gorilla grows to become a messianic figure by the end of the episode, and converts literally the entire world to Christianity. The important thing here is that her sign language is interpreted by a sign language interpreter who then relays the messages to the audience. This is important because it reflects on a major theme of Christianity, which is how God and the various prophets have their messages relayed to us via a secondary source. God spoke his word, that word got written down in the Bible by disciples, and then we read the Bible, which ends up being our interpretation of the biblical author's interpretations of God's word. In a sense, church figures do the same thing. People like the Pope tell us God's word second hand. In a sense, if we see Popo as God, which the episode of the title implies by being titled Signs from Godrilla, then the interpreter is the medium through which we are supposed to interpret the gorilla and thus God. The reason why this is important to recognize is because the sign interpreter's statements blatantly admit that Popo is playing on people's fears and insecurities in order to scare people into belief. By that token, this flashback could in part be a critique of religious figures who attempt to appoint themselves as the official speaker for God. The entire re-virgination scene reminds me a bit of Christian culture's emphasis on being very anti-sex, specifically the vir virginity pledges and purity balls that seem to be prevalent in evangelical Christianity. These things are, in my opinion, a bit creepy and invasive and imply an almost vaguely sexualized relationship between father and daughter. Not sexual, mind you, but sexualized in the sense that sexuality plays a role in how fathers and daughters relate to one another. The somewhat invasive notion of a virginity pledge is satirized here with the literal invasiveness of installing a new hymen. The casual discussion of the daughter's sex life that involves both openness and shaming I think is a critique of the awkward stance on sex and consequences of said awkward stance for evangelical Christians. The scene showcasing Christian radio is a jab at commercialized evangelism as well as the scene showing the film Seventh Helven. Seventh Helven in particular I think is a fun poke at Christian filmmaking that tries to balance being a compelling movie experience and being a Christian film, to the point where it bastardizes Christian themes in order to cater to action film sensibilities. The juxtaposition of Christianity with R-rated action undermines the Christian message. Both Seventh Helven and the radio show remind me a bit of things like the 
700 Club and Kirk Cameron, people who commercialize Christianity for profit, playing off of people's sympathies, fears, and religious conviction in order to generate cash, turning Christianity from a philosophy and belief system into a product for mass consumption. This is also important to note because it ties into Popo's rise to prominence. As she continues to become more and more popular, the industry of Christian evangelism propels her to stardom, allowing her message to spread to literally the entire world. This is all, of course, in the head of the priest, which is why these things all turn out effective. It's all a lie. The notion that spreading the gospel through commercialism and capitalism will lead to the inevitable salvation of all people. This is, in a way, a damning critique of the Christian entertainment industry, where the road to salvation, rather than leading them to the perfect scenario of the entire world being brought to heaven, instead leads to destruction. Xavier gets informed by the computer that all of the thoughts are coming from within his head. So basically this is all just made up. I think this is worth noting though because Xavier's character is, kind of, a white hippie guy who misunderstands varying forms of spirituality, but still adopts them regardless. Among those thoughts include Christian elements of his spirituality, and if I can project just a little, I imagine that a lot of the people that Xavier's character is a satire of are people who started out as Christians and then moved into New Age. After all, most people in America are raised Christians, so it's likely there is a lingering sense of Christianity within a character like Xavier. As such, this episode could be showcasing a bit of the psychology of Xavier as a character, his mind being largely formed by the often incoherent culture and philosophy of modern day Christianity, especially the kind we see commercialized in the United States. So this is what we see when Xavier takes the left hand path, the path of the mind, a path to destruction. However, the narrator makes a point to say that the path on the right is, from a different perspective, the path on the left. So he changed his mind and took the path on the right. His right. If you are facing him, it's your left. This is important, in my opinion, because it hints at the meaninglessness of the dichotomy between heart and mind. When Xavier f goes down the path of the mind, he mostly sees examples of people following their heart, with follow your heart being explicitly stated, as well as a point about dismissing the power of the rational mind. As such, the path of the mind ends up being the path of the heart regardless. This gets at the question of free will, because free will is asking the idea of, do we have autonomy, or some existential force driving us towards our actions and circumstances? Arguments of determinism include many ideas, including determinist arguments that appeal to religious reasoning, but one argument of determinism is that we're creatures of instinct, that the rational mind can only justify actions, but can't itself choose actions, or that our instinct as creatures leads to our mind thinking the way it does, and thus we can never truly Truly be free. Our choices are always caused by some sort of force external to the rational mind. The path of the mind, the path of rational thought, brings with it a story of people consciously choosing to reject the rational mind, and to follow their heart instead. The contemplation of choice leads to a lack of choice, both for the Christians and for Xavier. To stand and consider all possibilities is to drown in a tunneling sea of infinite potentiality. When Xavier takes the path on the right, the path of the heart, we see, rather than the destruction of others, instead the salvation of others, but the destruction of the self. All of the people he believes he saved are there to embrace him, but then they eat him alive and throw his corpse into a pile of dead bodies of other Xavier's. My best guess on this scene is that this is what's in Xavier's heart, in the sense that this is what he really wants, for people to love and appreciate him for what he's done for them. But instead, they cannibalize him. When they lift him up, his body is in a cross-like position. All of this showcases Xavier's conception of himself, a messiah complex, sacrificing himself for the benefit of others. It implies that Xavier does this because he wants others to love him, but also shows a deeper anxiety about those who he seeks the admiration of. The crowd eats him alive after he hears a flashback to his own birth, where his father says, it's some kind of monster. In a sense, the series as a whole, and this scene in particular, are about how Xavier's anxiety about his upbringing fuels his actions, but also undermines him. Episode 10 opens with a monologue about self. This is the episode where Xavier is forced to finally acknowledge that he was his father's murderer. It's not through learning or growing, it's entirely through being forced. The episode is extensively about the self, where Xavier has to deal with the psychological aftermath of recognizing his guilt. 
This is what leads to a very lengthy conversation between two Xavier's where the two try to one-up another. The whole episode is basically Xavier dissociating from guilt, where his mind quite literally splits in two so that he can project his guilt onto the other self and not have to hold himself accountable. At first, he does hold himself accountable and chooses to end his life in order to fulfill his promise, but then works around this by attempting to battle his other self to the death. In a sense, Xavier is finding a way to avoid having to learn the lesson about who he is. His mission to discover himself involves a refusal to believe what he finds, undermining any attempt at self-discovery, progress, or enlightenment. The episode seems to be a sort of reference to the kinds of western sunset showdowns that you might see in classic western films, which again plays into Xavier's self-image as a drifter and a rogue. In episode 1, he talked about how his only power is the ability to blow minds with his weapons-grade philosophical insight, and this is us seeing that play out, where this showdown isn't so much one of physical violence, but supposedly intellectual mastery, where Xavier basically talks his way out of his own guilt by envisioning it as an epic showdown of spiritual equals. The comparison between Xavier's psychology and Westerns is made textual by the quote, Listen, this psyche is not big enough for two metaphysical seekers. The increasingly immature nature of the conversation undermines the self-image. If Xavier sees himself as a steel cage of depth and spirituality, then yo mama jokes and talking about diarrhea of the mouth doesn't exactly complement his supposed depth. This episode demonstrates the whole dick measuring contest, because Xavier is using his sense of enlightenment and intellect in order to one-up himself. This is tangential, but I've talked elsewhere about the implicit masculinity of intellectual competitiveness and domination. To put it directly, there are a lot of insecure men, particularly online, who use identity politics about being pro-reason and pro-logic, who try to own others by showing themselves to be smarter than other people. This is all sort of coded as masculine, because they showcase a desire to flaunt how much they know and understand, and often, these people go out looking for arguments to have so that they can flex their mind muscles in order to make themselves feel good by dominating someone else mentally. I bring this up because this attitude is, in essence, a dick measuring contest, and very much mirrors this episode of Xavier, where they s resort to petty insults and nonsense in order to maintain control of the conversation. It becomes ironic then that the people who tout themselves as rational and enlightened turn out to be petty and immature. This episode of Xavier isn't directly about the people I mentioned, but it does very much touch on a theme that is relevant to the kinds of people Xavier is critiquing. People who use the notion of enlightenment as a way to flex superiority. This is true of a lot of the New Age types that the show is directly addressing, and indirectly it's true of a lot of the men who fixate on trying to be the smartest, deepest, most knowledgeable, or most rational. This dick measuring contest is made explicit when they reveal their penises to be peen eyes, an eyeball on their crotch. This is, as I said towards the beginning of this video, a reference to a third eye, the eye through which we can achieve enlightenment. Comparing the egotistical enlightenment that Xavier attempts to show off in every episode to a dick measuring contest is a great visual that really gets at the heart of why the show is critiquing the kinds of people that Xavier represents, because their minds aren't in the right place. In a sense, they masculinize enlightenment and turn it into a masturbatory exercise about making yourself look good rather than growing as a person. In this sense, the show is exactly what the creator said, a warning about the dangers of his spirituality, those dangers being the capacity to ignore problems of the self and to avoid self-improvement, and to seek enlightenment as a symbol of status rather than a symbol of virtue. The ending of the episode is hard to really discuss. It reminds me a bit of the concept of ego-death in both spirituality and in psychedelic culture. The idea of the complete separation from the self. Consciousness devoid of the limitations of ego. I can't say much about what the ending means, except that I think it relates to Xavier's eagerness to divorce his own guilt over his father's murder from himself. After he literally separates his guilt and inability to reconcile into an external version of himself, he then kills the external version and through the supposed power of enlightenment. As a means of maintaining a sense of righteousness, he divorces himself from his guilt, and there's an irony here, using ego death as a means of preserving the ego rather than letting go. Episode 11, the first episode of season 2, begins us off with a monologue about mantras. The episode addresses Catholicism briefly, but mostly focuses on Buddhism. The main plot of the episode surrounds both Xavier trying to replace a couple's dead child, and antidepressants being made by Buddhist monks who turn their chants into pills. 
The episode is sort of a critique of pharmaceuticals, but I think on a bigger level, it's more of a critique of capitalism and commercialism, and how people in the West sort of completely misunderstand the philosophy behind things like Buddhism. For me, the most vital part of the episode is the advertisement about Fiddlin. New Age's biggest flaw, that is being critiqued in this show at least, is the tendency towards co-opting ideologies for their perceived benefits while failing to understand them or the culture that they sprung from. This ad blatantly commercializes the oppression of Buddhist monks as well as their philosophical beliefs and outlook on life as a means of selling a prepackaged version of these things to people in the West. This is, at once, a reference to sweatshop labor, and also a reference, I feel, to New Age and the sort of commercialization and westernization of non-Western beliefs and cultures. The ad explicitly mentions some of the history behind Buddhist chanting, but then states, but in our sophisticated world, who has time for that noise? I think this ad demonstrates very well the overarching theme of the show, exploiting ideologies and cultures for personal gain, which in the process of doing so involves completely misunderstanding the very ideology and culture that one claims to support. The scene where Xavier enters the Buddhist temple, attempting to get them to rebel, is very obviously showing the overarching theme of Xavier failing to comprehend the underlying philosophy of other cultures and religions, and also his narcissistic desire to help others who don't really need it. But I feel like this scene also takes on a light double meaning, and that it reminds me very much of the sort of outsider approach to social issues where someone identifies what they perceive to be an issue that doesn't affect them directly without fully understanding it, and then proceed to forcefully enter into the situation as the only person capable of helping the helpless. To refer to earlier, this is, in part, a savior complex. At this point, you could almost call it an Xavier complex, the obsessive need to both dictate someone's problems to them and then proceed to solve them for self-gratification, speaking without listening. Xavier again completely fails to understand Buddhism by trying to coerce them into indulging in hedonistic pleasures and material desires. He basically tries to instill Western values on them, which plays well into the major theme of the series. Not only does he try to steal values from other cultures without understanding them, in this very process, he imposes his own mixed-up values onto the very cultures he steals from. Towards the end, there's a visual joke where Mother Mary is breastfeeding Buddha, and Buddha craps out Xavier. I think this visual joke is potentially a mockery of New Age, where a Western, more Christian worldview is fed through an Eastern Buddhist worldview, until the excrement result of those two things is, of course, Xavier. Episode 12 begins with a monologue about what it means to be a man, as well as protection. He talks about being a great protector, and this is relevant to this video for two reasons. One, because it gets a little bit more into Xavier's psychology, referencing his masculinity, saying that his desire to protect others is in part a result of his need to be manly. And two, because the episode contrasts the nature of protection in the sense that Xavier describes with the sort of protection that characterizes a mob, intimidation and exploitation that is given the guise of being protected. Protection. And of course, these two things, Xavier's notion of protection and the mob notion, turn out to be basically the same thing over the course of the episode. Xavier befriends a mobster unknowingly, and tries to protect him by figuring out a non-existent person behind a non-existent threat to the mobster. As a result of trying to protect the mobster, he inadvertently fuels the mobster's exploitation and intimidation. First to the people who he already bullies, and then the police, and then eventually extorts the afterlife itself. Xavier's most basic failure to understand anything involves genuinely helping someone for once, but helping the exact wrong person. It's also worth noting that he tries to help a window washer out of being suicidal even though he wasn't suicidal in the first place, and inadvertently convinces him to commit suicide, which just goes to show how useful Xavier's protection is. The comparison between mobster intimidation and Xavier's desire for protection feels like it could be a jab at the kinds of people Xavier represents. Either that they themselves are bullying and intimidating others under the guise of protection, or that they're aiding and abetting bullies and intimidators. Not much to say about this episode, it's pretty straightforward. Episode 13's opening monologue talks about the sacredness of life, especially the lives of animals, and the episode deals at least in part with the ethics of meat consumption. Conversations about the meat industry, free-range animals, veganism, and the ethics of these kinds of things get very muddled with no clear answer other than live your life how you best see fit and don't force your choice onto others. 
Because it's such a muddled conversation already, and because Xavier is such an absurd show by design, it's hard to really tell what direction the episode is pointing in when it comes with a satirical message about this topic. But given that the show is so deliberately absurd, I could easily see that the topics of meat consumption are just here because the creators think the whole conversation is funny, or because they thought they could make jokes off of it. I do know that in Wonder Shows, and the same creators made jabs at the meat industry for being unethical multiple times, most notably in the hot dog factory skit. And here in Xavier, I imagine that given the rest of the show is a jab at the hypocrisy of certain kinds of liberals who feed off of narcissism rather than goodwill, I imagine the show isn't taking a definitive stance in the conversation except against the sort of narcissistic liberalism and faux spirituality that masquerades as benevolent. That said, I'm going to try to make sense of what the episode is saying about this stuff regardless. The episode begins with Xavier being shown the ethical meat harvesting inside a fancy restaurant, and this whole scene seems to be taking a jab at free-range meat. The idea that slaughtering animals can be done ethically as long as the animals were treated well before being slaughtered. Here, being treated well is taken to an absurd extreme, and the restaurant seems to see themselves as sensitive and loving, but how quickly they get to harvesting and serving the meat immediately after feels like a joke at the expense of the cognitive dissonance of free-range meat advocates and farms, thinking of that as a more humane way of slaughtering animals. It could, of course, just be absurdity for absurdity's sake. Xavier discovers two homeless men and notices their poor conditions being contrasted with the more luxurious treatment of animals. This, on its own, could be a comment on the murky ethics of animal rights activism, but it's worth noting that Xavier's solution is to literally turn the homeless men into animals, which, when you consider what the animals are being raised for, showcases Xavier's failure to understand all too well. This is more than likely coincidence, but his solution reminds me of neoliberal standards of achieving social and economic equality. Specifically, making things worse for everybody in order to balance the playing field, rather than making things better for everybody. A more obvious answer would be to help the homeless men in a way that didn't result in them immediately being turned into food for rich people to consume. Another coincidence, but it ever so vaguely reminds me of the plot of Soylent Green. One of the major plot threads of the episode revolves around the aura of one of the homeless men. Auras are a distinctly New Age idea, with the basic idea being that auras are a metaphysical entity that surrounds our bodies and binds us together. Repeatedly throughout the episode, there's a joke about one of the homeless men treating various adhesives, including huffing glue, as a sort of drug, and this is expanded into the aura, being a form of spiritual glue. The comparison between drugs and aura is already on its own damning enough, but the episode takes it a step further when his aura leaves Xavier, playing into the cliché of a woman with daddy issues, and she becomes a sex worker. The comparison between sex work and auras is yet another jab at New Age ideology, a mockery of how the aura concept is a bastardization of spirituality akin to spiritual masturbation. It's worth noting that auras borrow from the actual Hindu and Buddhist concepts of chakras and kind of butcher it in the process. In a sense, the episode could be implying that New Age people are pimping out older religions through their co-opting of those ideas into pseudoscience like auras. As just a personalized side, I don't really feel like I'm all that on board with portraying sex work in a negative light like so much media does, and I do think that using sex work to make a joke at the expense of New Age is a bit in poor taste. I don't find it offensive necessarily, I just think it falls flat because it's based on an assumption that I don't agree with. The idea that sex work is bad or that comparing something to sex work as a way to insult it is useful, I just think it doesn't really work because I've never seen sex workers or sex work as a really bad thing in and of itself. Itself. Though I do see a lot of flaws in the sex industry, which would be, in a sense, a better comparison to make for the sake of satire. This show is basically designed to be as offensive as possible, so I'm not going to put it through the grinder or anything, but that's just my minor critique of the show. See it for what it's worth. Towards the end, Xavier ends up creating a spiritually transmitted disease when he tries to sleep with the aura, and the spiritually transmitted disease spreads until it takes over the whole town. This ending gets a, at a bit of why the show seems to be so against the sorts of things that Xavier represents. It spreads. Auras are used as a pseudoscientific practice in New Age approaches to medicine, and this is really, really dangerous. The ending where Xavier's interactions with Aura lead to spiritual health problems and spread until it overtakes the whole town is indicative of the way in which New Age spreads and, in a sense, infects people like an STD. When people adopt a New Age mentality, they go seeking spiritual, mental, and physical health through New Age approaches. 
New Age approaches, so the show suggests, don't actually help anything and are self-serving, a placebo at best and narcissistic masturbation at worst. It goes a step beyond, though, when things like aura and chiropractic and homeopathy are practiced as a means of substituting actual ways of combating mental and physical health issues. This is why Xavier's origin is lingering anxieties from childhood. While I don't necessarily agree with the show portraying this as the root cause underlying turning to new, de new Age ideology, I do think it's important to note that people who use New Age as a means of ignoring or combating physical and mental health issues are doing themselves a disservice and can become dangerous for them as individuals, but it can become even more dangerous when it spreads. The idea of a spiritually transmitted disease is in line with the actual physical and mental health risks that come from using meaningless New Age beliefs to fill the void. I don't want to pry too much into the personal lives of the creators, but I do know that Vernon Chapman was eventually involved in the production of Andy Kaufman's posthumous album, and John Lee has in the past mentioned being influenced by Andy Kaufman. Kaufman himself was a guy who, in a last-ditch effort to survive cancer, had attempted a New Age approach. I can't meaningfully say that this inspired them to make Xavier Renegade Angel, but I feel like stories like this, where people turn to New Age out of desperation and New Age doesn't help, obstructs, or even actively harms those who turn to it, I think plays into what Xavier Renegade Angel is really all about. To quote the creators, it's a warning to children and adults about the dangers of spirituality. Episode 14 is really hard to make sense of, because the episode seems to mostly tackle on themes lightly and be more focused on the humor of the episode than, say, an episode like Signs from Godzilla. What I can discern are some themes relating to racism, environmentalism, issues in society, and the thin line between friend and enemy. There's an element of neediness to Xavier's constant obsession over finding friends. There's also an element of exploitation, where Xavier is willing to sell out his own friends in order to get closer to another person. The episode gets a bit into Xavier's psychology as a character, that his need for validation, which we've earlier seen lacking from family members, also stems from a lack of friendship. Xavier's all alone, and this leads him towards who he is now. It's worth noting that getting sucked into the kind of destructive, self-satisfied philosophy that New Age can be is a lot easier to have happen without a support network to keep one in check. Though I really doubt this episode was suggesting this thematically, when the easier answer is just to say that the show is more likely calling New Age people losers with no friends. The episode has a character. Dark Notion, who is a parody of the emo subculture that I think was a lot more common around the time of the show's initial release. The character's portrayal mocks emos as being sort of pretentious and having an almost fetishistic delight in their own misery, treating self-harm and self-destruction as artful, poetic expression. Dark Notion explains that society is to blame for his own suffering. Xavier makes another friend, a windmill worker who eventually learns how to enslave wind, at which point wind becomes a somewhat blunt metaphor for slavery, which by extension would mean anti-black racism, including a joke about anti-black slurs. If I were to guess the major message of the episode, it has to do with how Xavier desires both the friendship of the supposedly downtrodden and that of what, in this episode, you could call an oppressor. Now, to be perfectly clear, I do think that self-harm is a very serious issue, and I do think that the abuse and neglect in relationships, family, and in society at large that lead to people becoming depressed and self-harming are very important issues that need to be addressed. But in this episode, the juxtaposition of slavery and implied racism with a pretentious emo, I think is a jab at emo subculture and the kinds of subcultures that come from similar perspectives. I wrote about this as it relates to heavy metal subculture. In heavy metal subculture, there is this mentality of being the oppressed, of being in a lesser group for having been poorly treated growing up, especially being bullied for listening to heavy metal and being a part of that subculture. And while there is validity to the issues at hand, these aren't issues of systemic oppression on the same level as what I used in my video were the examples of misogyny and transphobia. By extension, metal subculture not only did not spawn out of a deeper systemic oppression based on an identity like that of the LGBTQ community, but they also reproduced some of those very same acts of oppression within the community by marginalizing women and LGBTQ people within metal subculture. My best guess with this episode is that there's a vaguely similar critique being made of emo subculture, that they not only aren't quite the victims of society as they think they are, but they are, to quote the show, by definition, part of society. So if I had to guess, the show is mocking the victim complex of emo subculture and comparing it to actual systemic racism in order to highlight the absurdity of goth and emo counterculture portraying itself as being truly oppressed. 
Again, I don't really agree with this critique if that's what the show is going for, and I think it's much more complicated than that, but this is the best I can discern of what the episode is saying. Beyond that, though, the way in which Xavier is willing to befriend complete ideological opponents and sell both of them out might be another jab at New Age people, but if so, I don't know if I can get any more specific because the episode is a little muddled. Episode 15, Haunted Tonk, is extensively about Xavier as a character and his history with his mother. Season 1 had a main plot about searching for his father's murderer, and Season 2 carries the overarching plot of searching for his long-lost mother. Most of the episode revolves around a strip club that was built in the same spot where Xavier's house used to be, but the sp stuff that seems most relevant to the big picture of the show is when Xavier goes back in time to talk to his younger self. This segment reminds me a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, but in reverse. Xavier became the way he is now because he retroactively envisioned his life in such a way that he had been there to teach himself how to be himself. This whole scene is incoherent to the point of being hilarious, and that's probably the point. Why people turn to New Age spirituality itself is, so the show seems to imply, not exactly coherent either. During this flashback, it's worth noting at least two things. That Xavier's desire to instill his younger self with the spiritual conviction that he has now is in part about trying to turn his younger self into a man, and that Xavier talks about abandoning linear modes of rational thought. The desire to abandon rational thought, as well as the ties between spirituality and masculinity, I think relate to the bigger themes of the series. The series, as a whole, seems to ask, how does a guy like Xavier come to exist? And it answers it by saying, insecurities, failure to understand, narcissism, and a whole lot of masculinity issues. It's also worth noting that my tiny background in sociology makes me want to notice a theme that has a bit more sociological of a framework. Xavier, as an adult, tries to instill a sense of spirituality and masculinity into his younger self, to the point where Xavier projects his older self onto his younger self, thus turning him into himself, I think. Anyways, what happens next is that young Xavier, who at first doesn't understand Xavier's ideology, begins to parrot it seemingly without knowing what he's doing. This reminds me a lot of the socialization process and how children often build off of stereotypes and patterns that they pick up on from adults, either directly through teaching or indirectly through example and observation, to the point that children mimic the behaviors and beliefs of adults seemingly without actually understanding it. I know this through researching stuff about gender socialization and how stereotypes and performance sort of construct a gender identity in young children and how this forms the basic process of gender identity in people overall, but it can easily be seen through a more religious lens. The film Jesus Camp shows an example of a youth who wants to get into preaching, and I've seen people sort of taken aback by that kid and how he mimics the convictions and understanding of an adult preacher, but how creepy it feels knowing he's just a kid and, hypothetically, doesn't know any better. I don't know if it's a theme of Xavier intentionally, but this episode certainly demonstrates how adult intervention cultivates a sense of self that is in part inflicted on children by adults, and reminds me of the socialization process. If this is intentional, then the reasoning would be clear, referencing New Age and ideologies like New Age as incoherent and self-perpetuating, inflicted onto others even sometimes from a young age, finding new audiences through convincing them while they're young. This can also be potentially a reference to religion in general, how religious beliefs often coincide with being taught them at a young age. I've been dying to get to this one. Before I cover my thoughts on this episode, it's worth noting that, like with episode 1, there is a fan commentary that discusses some of the themes of the episode a bit briefly. I don't recall everything the fan commentary said, but I remember him mentioning the name Damnesia Vu and how the name relates to the constant repetition of Xavier dying and being reborn, a reference to reincarnation. And he also mentioned how the main premise of the episode, a series of doors that Xavier goes into that seem to represent different pieces of his consciousness, is a reference to Aldous Huxley's The Doors of Perception. In The Doors of Perception, he talks about the mind being filtered through various doors that allow us to live the normal lives that we live, but prevent us from being able to experience an expanded form of consciousness known as the mind at large. When all the doors are opened, this is when the mind at large can be experienced, and this is achievable through psychedelic drugs like LSD. The episode is really hard to make sense of on first viewing. To be honest, I can't help but feel like there's a meta quality lingering somewhere in the episode. They knew the episode was going to be a two-parter, with part two being Damnesia U, an episode created largely by fans. 
As such, it's easy to see a similarity between the two episodes as both having somewhat of a meta meaning going on. The main premise of the episode is that Xavier has forgotten everything about himself and is caught in a loop of repeatedly trying to enter into different doors trying to escape. These different doors, I guess, if we go with the comparison to the mind at large concept, are different aspects of Xavier's mind, or of Xavier's perception of reality. On a meta level, I feel like the episode calls attention to Xavier as a show, as well as potentially shows and comedy shows in general. The episode contains Xavier appearing out of nowhere, and then performing a repetitive task of going to various places and then returning to this room. The episode ends with audience applause, and then Xavier returns right back into the limo he's, limbo he started in. Comedy shows follow a general episodic format of starting and ending in the same place, where the shows start with normalcy, and then things go off the rails until they get resolved at the end and everything returns to normal. This is taken to the extreme in a show like The Simpsons, where after 30 years of being on the air, the characters have managed to stay at the same age, work at the same jobs, live in the same house, go to the same school in the same grade, etc. Sitcoms are, after all, a format. The format is about repetition as a framework to hang for jokes. People want the same thing over and over again with just the content itself being different. The format that Xavier started out with was Xavier drifting into a town after delivering a monologue, and then leaving the town having helped nobody and learned no lesson, but believing he had learned a lesson and helped everybody. I do know that the creators of Xavier have a tendency to get a little postmodern and self-referential, and we saw a lot of this on Wonder Chosen, such as with the episode Patience, that spent half of the episode playing the episode in reverse. It seems that both shows became a bit more playful with the format as time went on, so my instinct is to say that this episode is, in part, a sort of semi-psychedelic take on Xavier as a show, and the format of the show. The action of entering into a new setting in order to help people and messing everything up in the process is repeated a few times in the episode, and I feel it could possibly be a commentary on how Xavier as a show has become repetitive, with the creators themselves sort of stuck in a loop of making the same basic episode over and over again, and if so, then it'd be simultaneously a self-critique and an attempt to move away from the very same repetitive premise that the show is critiquing. Now, forgive me for getting a little homeworky here, but I want to point out one particular line of dialogue that I think is really relevant to this episode. It's the phrase, seven glimpses into your own soul. This is important because I was trying to tie in the overarching themes of New Age ideology with the episode's reference to the doors of perception. I realized that in New Age, the New Age conception of chakras is that there are seven chakras, each aligning with different colors of the rainbow and each representing some facet of a person's spirit as well as some sacred truth that we can learn from. I think the seven soul glimpses is a reference to this as well as to the seven demons that shows up on Xavier's shoulder later in the episode. I think that on top of that, the Chakras in New Age intersect with the doors of perception and the themes within. Forgive me for using Wikipedia as a source, but according to the wiki pages on chakras, Carolyn Miss says that every thought and experience you've ever had in your life gets filtered through these chakra databases. Each event is recorded into your cells. The description of chakras as filters reminds me a lot of the idea of the doors of perception as filters of reality. In a sense, getting in tune with one's chakras is to achieve the mind at large in a new age spiritual sense, as opposed to the psychedelic sense that Huxley was referring to. I tried to look into both chakras and the doors of perception a bit more thoroughly, and they both seem to have similar end goals of becoming in tune with oneself and achieving a more comprehensive understanding of reality. The doors of perception, skimming through it, I see a lot of interesting ideas. One thing that caught my eye is Huxley talking about language, and how human language helps us to be able to more effectively comprehend reality, but also simultaneously, and somewhat ironically, limits our ability to comprehend reality, such that we're always having our comprehension framed through the lens of faulty language. Here's a relevant quote. Every individual is at once the beneficiary and the victim of the linguistic tradition into which he has been born. The beneficiary, inasmuch as language, gives access to the acclimated records of other people's experience. The victim, insofar as it confirms him in the belief that reduced awareness is the only awareness as it bedevils his sense of reality, so that he is all too apt to take his concepts for data, his words for actual things.
I wanted to share this quote because I think it's fairly vital to the themes of the show and of this episode in particular. I've said in a previous video that there are two realms, the realm of the real and the realm of discourse. This is just an easy way of visualizing the faultiness of language. Reality is physical objects and phenomena. Language is how we communicate and interpret physical phenomena, such that when we see a rock, we see the physical object that we have given the label rock. The word rock is just a naturally meaningless sound that we give meaning through language. If you were to look at the painting of the pipe where it says this is not a pipe, the whole point of that painting is that it's not actually a pipe. It's a picture of a pipe. It's an imitation. It's a means of creating the idea in your head of a pipe without there being an actual pipe. That's how language works. The word rock is not the same thing as the actual physical object, but when we say rock, we create the image in our head of the physical object. Because reality is always, forever, interpreted through faulty perception and through language, and because language itself is faulty, we can often create the illusion of reality that is not actually there. This is why that quote is relevant. He is all too apt to take his concept for data, his words for actual things. We get so used to the language and communication of ideas that we can often convince ourselves that things are real when they're, in fact, only conceptual. This is very true of metaphysics and spirituality, where we conceive of concepts and then our internal and external experiences lead us to believe that these hypothetical concepts are real things. It's confirmation bias. We first are told about ghosts, then we have an idea in our head that there is such a thing as a ghost, and then we see a strange flash of light in a dark hallway, and then because we already have the conception that ghosts are a thing, our confirmation bias causes us to believe that we had seen a ghost. This is all relevant to Xavier and that the sort of new age spirituality that Xavier runs on is one of confirmation bias. One in which these hypothetical concepts are conceived of and then our limited perception causes us to view the world through a lens that already is clouded by what we conceive, and then anything that happens confirms their beliefs to be true. The framing of language in dwarves of perception is that once you learn a language, how you understand the language forever clogs your ability to truly perceive reality, because reality is always lost in translation into the oversimplification that language presents. This could also be said to be true of spiritual beliefs like the kind that Xavier believes. Because he's always in a limited state of perception, because of the sort of spiritual language that New Age has taught him, he's never able to fully understand reality. The episode, ultimately, ends where it begins, in a suspended state of limbo. Remember that he begins the episode with no recollection of who he is or where he is. He's lost in his own mind, trying to make sense of it all, but his mind is filtering his perceptions such that he can't actually make sense of things. When he finally opens all of the doors, removing the filters, we get exactly where we started, a loop. Similar to the first episode, the quest for a higher level of being, as Xavier puts it himself in the episode, leads to limbo. This could be suggesting that the sort of quest for a higher state of mental and spiritual being that New Age proponents often tout as possible through their ideology ultimately leads to a non-answer, a loop. Ironically, while trying to research into this, I was blocked by a paywall from being able to read the books on chakras that would help me make more sense of the episode. There's something a bit fishy about selling enlightenment, as though if it were really valuable information, it would transcend the need for monetary compensation. As the fan mentary points out, there is a sort of hell aspect to the episode too, where the title Damnesia Vu references deja vu, amnesia, and damnation. Xavier is damned into this perpetual state of confusion and soul searching, looping endlessly, which is why I said before that I think there's a meta component to the themes of the episode. Xavier is a rat running in the maze of his own mind, and this is his hell, forever being stuck just three steps away from the enlightenment that he so badly craves. The potential comparison between Xavier's mind and hell is fitting, but feels a bit like speculation. It's a bit hard to make sense of the details of the episode, but there appears to be a lot of contextual background to this one that sort of ties outside sources into the internal themes of the show. The main plot of episode 17 revolves around Xavier deciding to go normal and give up his protective ways after realizing that people are ungrateful. The episode is a weird sort of absurdist parody of sitcoms, in particular mocking sitcom po plotline cliches. It's the show's take on other shows. The title, Going Normal, is both in reference to the character of Xavier trying to pretend to be normal and also a reference to the show doing its take on a normal comedy show. 
it plays on a few comedy cliches throughout the episode. One example is the cliche of you can say that again, followed by some sort of dumb punchline where the character misunderstands what they're supposed to say again. And another example is a cliche of someone coming up with an idea based on something seemingly innocuous that someone else said, to the point where the show even says, I think I get what he's saying. He means we just gotta take wild leaps in interpreting his mundane statements, then come up with our own ideas. The show also pokes fun at the whole family life aspect of the generic sitcom, where Xavier enters into a family and basically ruins their life. I imagine this scene is all just a big jab at the typical sitcom nuclear family. Stuff like All in the Family or Married with Children shows that play on dumpy, deadbeat fathers. It could be mocking the idea of how TV portrays normalcy, where shitty fathers are normalized in sitcoms, just like how Xavier tries to achieve normalcy by being a shitty father and husband. Even The Simpsons, a show meant to be a satire of the traditional American family as portrayed in media, eventually became the thing that it tried to mock when Homer Simpson went from being a satirical take on deadbeat fathers to being sort of a glorification of deadbeat fathers. Given that the trope has become so commonplace, the trope itself doesn't really reflect a critique of American culture as much as it does provide an example of American culture, turning deadbeat fathers into iconography rather than a joke. Xavier isn't so much criticizing those shows as much as lifting the iconography for the sake of a cheap parody. Ultimately, what the episode is commenting on isn't any moral failing of shows like The Simpsons or Married with Children, but more just commenting on how mundane they've become. Bad canned laughter and cliche prepackaged jokes. Even the puns in the episode are cliche in such a way that doesn't fit with typical Xavier dialogue, and is more in line with the kind of basic bad comedy that plagues the shows that the episode is making fun of. Being an absurdist take on normalcy turns this episode into a much less off-the-walls episode than previous ones, but also it makes it take on a more surreal quality because it almost begins to feel like an actual sitcom. Almost. The show makes a deliberate reference to one cliche of comedy, and to a particular TV show that was a prime example of this cliche, the man in drag trope. Xavier is mocking the show Bosom Buddies, the 80s Tom Hanks show where Tom Hanks and a friend try to live in a woman's only hotel by dressing up as women. The cliche of men dressing up as women as a comedy gag is really old and has been accused of being problematic, but beyond that it's just so trite. Xavier then takes this premise to the extreme when Xavier repeatedly has to wear more layers of disguises. The episode also critiques businesses by mocking the neoliberal approach of fixating so much on maximizing profits as to pollute food and exploit Chinese labor, and also going to absurd degrees for marketing stunts like trying to build a hot dog chain to the moon. You could argue that these jokes have an additional layer of mocking the way that businesses are portrayed sympathetically on TV. Or in a show like Seinfeld, a business place is an excuse for wacky hijinks, rather than capitalist exploitation. I don't know if that's intentional, but the episode definitely pokes fun at corrupt business practices. The episode ends with Xavier embracing his freakish self, but like usual, his actions cause the death of everyone but himself. The show takes one last poke at comedy cliches when Xavier calls attention to the irony of his failure to notice everything in danger when he goes on a speech about promising to help. The episode then ends with Xavier saying, Your television just shattered! One last joke that seems like a simultaneous condemnation of the sorts of sitcoms that inspired the episode, as well as Xavier itself. Basically saying that what you just watched was shit. The opening of episode 18 briefly covers Islamophobia, when the episode begins with some redneck tourist threatening to beat up a Muslim man, and calling him slurs and the like. It turns out to be a deliberately designed simulation for what appears to be hate crime tourism. The idea that an entire industry and business could revolve around allowing white Americans an opportunity to hate and attack Muslims on its own could say a lot about how institutionalized anti-Islam prejudices have become in the West. And this was clearly being alluded to in the opening. But the opening is really just setting up for the major theme of the episode, which revolves around the complicated and intense relationship between America and the Middle East. Early in the episode, Xavier has a seance where he speaks for a dead man, the man who invented lotion, in front of a town of grieving people. This scene on its own is worth noting as a light mockery of seances and mediums. Xavier very clearly is faking it when he asks if somebody is wearing a black shirt. 
They're at a funeral, so that would be obvious, and does nothing to actually demonstrate that he's speaking for the dead. Following this, the constant asking for a show of hand for Xavier's skill as a medium is a sign that it's all about showmanship. This scene, where Xavier portrays the act of channeling the dead as self-gratifying and transparently fake, fits right in with the themes of the show as mocking the sorts of manipulative pseudo-spirituality that people like mediums and like New Age advocates put out into the world. The episode first sets up an implicitly right-wing and capitalist component to the themes by portraying the people of the town as xenophobic and completely unwilling to give up the wealth that they quote-unquote earned, even though they really won it through the lottery. The episode is sort of critiquing right-wing ideology, and takes it a step further when Xavier tells them to be selfish and demonizes communism in the process. This is all supposed to be in reference to the Golden Rule, which he bastardizes when he says that the idea is gold rules. This is actually funny to me, because the Golden Rule is treat others how you'd like to be treated. While I'm not sure if it originated in the Bible, it was one of Christ's teachings in the Bible, and there and in general, it's meant to engender empathy and compassion for others. It's probably a coincidence, but the fact that what could be seen as an at least partially biblical teaching of love and respect gets twisted into the I, gets, I get what's mine and you get nothing mentality of neoconservatives, I think serves as a nice parallel to how right-wing pundits and politicians tend to twist biblical teachings and basic rules of morality in order to make them suit a selfish, capitalist agenda. The fact that the characters literally gold-plate themselves to celebrate their excess of money and, by capitalism standards, value, is then undermined by them going bankrupt as a result. This feels like somewhat of a jab at greed and the sorts of unrestrained capitalism that conservatives value, especially when their solution after losing money is to turn the town into a business. Capitalism fixes itself, so they seem to believe, and indeed, they fix their economic issues by building ties to what else? The Middle East. The Islamophobia at the beginning of the episode becomes reversed on itself when the townspeople are themselves turned into tourist attractions for Middle Eastern men. The history of America with the Middle East is one rife with conflict and war, but a large part of it has been business ties with oil producers. Simply put, America kind of needs the Middle East for oil, and so there has been this incoherent mix of xenophobia and surface-level friendliness, and this awkward relationship between hating Muslims and their culture and wanting favors from them is showcased in this episode. The solution to America's problems, of course, can't be to make changes to capitalism or even move away from capitalism altogether, it has to be to commodify human life for a cheap buck. It's not a new critique or a particularly nuanced critique, but the show presents it in a novel way. Towards the end, the townspeople are all forcibly converted to Islam. This is probably a stretch, but I feel like this might be a joke uh, about creeping Sharia. This whole idea that in the West, Islam is trying to spread its ideology by sort of enforcing Islamic principles under the pretense of being about tolerance, but against the will of people in the West. Creeping Sharia is, of course, a nonsense conspiracy theory, so it would fi fit right in with the themes of the show, even if coincidental. The ending makes a reference to the other side of the relationship with the Middle East, simply going at war with the Middle East in order to take their oil and profit off of it. Precisely this happens, and then one last jab at capitalism happens when they use the money to buy the network, and then sell the network to the Arabs. All in all, a pretty good episode. I don't even know how I'm supposed to understand this episode. How am I supposed to make sense of it? It's literally a fan-made episode. They compiled fan submissions of Xavier skits and then turned it into an episode of the series. It's tempting to say that this episode has no meaning at all and was just made because they were lazy or because they liked the idea of a fan-made episode. Regardless, I'd like to talk about this episode at least a little bit because it'd be a shame to miss out on my chance to talk about it. I could potentially come at this episode from three different angles. One is in the context of the show itself and more postmodern aspects of the episode. Two is to analyze the actual fan-made content for any themes that fans put into their skits. And three is to come at it from the perspective of PFR and how they might have attempted to tie these skits together in a way that suggested something coherent, or at least as coherent as a typical Xavier episode. I'm going to attempt to do all three, so here we go. Xavier as a show is already a show that delves occasionally in postmodernism. Going Normal, for example, was an episode that addressed the nature of comedy and comedy in a TV format especially. If anything, it was mocking sitcom cliches. Xavier, as a character, has an obsession with what it means to be Xavier, and the sense of who he is, where he came from, what his purpose is. Almost ironically, the show itself seems to have a postmodern interest in the show of Xavier Renegade Angel. 
the amnesia vu apart from its own themes relating to the doors of perception and reincarnation all of that to me at least also suggested a postmodern element referencing the nature of the show it took the repetitiveness of the format of xavier drifting into various settings looking for answers and sped the process up some of these could even be seen as different interpretations of xavier as a show here's what the show could have been if it were 2d here's what it could have been if everyone were moving in reverse here's what it could have been with no gravity it's probably all conjecture, but that idea is explicit here in Damnesia U. Now it's not the creators reinterpreting their own show, it's fans reinterpreting the show. In live action, in 2D, in 3D, in crummy footage of a dog eating ketchup, it's all there. I think that the creators of the show very much like Xavier as a character. Wonder Chosen was, if anything, a sort of ensemble cast of characters with no one character being emphasized as being most important. The same could be said of their next show, The Heart She Holler. Xavier is the only show of their own creation that seemed to be extensively a sort of character study, though that may be putting it in a bit of highbrow terms. The show isn't about a premise, the show is about Xavier. And I imagine that part of the idea behind a fan-made episode was to see their own ideas reflected back to them by their audience. What is their audience seeing in this show? What are they seeing in this character? For the creators, it may have been a chance just to see where both the comedy and the themes of the show go when in the hands of the audience. This is, if anything, the death of death of the author, letting fan interpretations become the show. Regardless of intent, I think it's a really fun chance for fans to be a part of the end result, and it makes for a very compelling episode worth watching, though not compelling in any stereotypically TV sense of the word. As for themes within individual skits, the thing that tends to be repeating throughout all of them is that Xavier says a lot of nonsense. They seem to take a fairly surface level understanding of the show, which is fine, because the show isn't particularly deep, even though it is, in my opinion, pretty clever in how it approaches satire. That said, it's worth noting that one of the major points of the series is that Xavier doesn't know what the hell he's saying, but thinks he does. So even though most of what the skits show is nonsense, that actually fits really well with what the show is going for. It's also worth noting that the skits play around with wordplay and do a pretty good job of feeling like an impression of the way that Xavier talks, in particular his weird mix of immaturity and pretentiousness. The skits also occasionally reference some basic religious stuff, like church, a Mormon missionary, the yin-yang, and so on. In general, the skits don't really feel that meaningful. However, when tied together, they do sort of form a coherent feeling. Not so much meaning, but feeling. So if I were to con contemplate the way in which the skits could be tied into some sort of coherent theme, what I find most relevant is the repetition of the word self. Self becomes a motif, and is even sung in a song that I'm pretty sure PFR wrote and recorded for one of the animated segments. What this reminds me of most is Shaka Stray Blowdown, an episode that started off with self as a major theme. In that episode, it was sort of a about a splitting of the mind, dissociating from the self in order to avoid guilt. If I were to be able to find a theme in Damnesia U, it's a similar theme regarding the self, a fragmented self dissociating not just from his own guilt, but from his very reality. Damnesia Vu is based on the premise that these are all different pieces of Xavier's mind, that his reality is filtered into this series of doors. This concept of the doors repeats in Damnesia U, but instead of seeing glimpses into Xavier's mind from the lens of the creators, we're seeing glimpses of his mind from the lens of the audience. This is true of all art, but especially true of interactive art, though your interactions will completely change how you understand the art and interpret it. Looking at a video game, for example, we can have something like Ludo Narrative Dissonance, where the themes of a game are at odds with how players experience it, because a game that is vocally anti-violence can also, somehow, at the same time, be a shooter, which inadvertently encourages violence within the game. The capacity for dissonance between artist intent and audience reaction is especially prevalent when interacting with the art can interfere with the art. This episode almost feels like an interactive art in the sense that the art incorporates audience participation, which on a certain level changes the meaning and changes the character as well. And this is where we can get to something more postmodern, where intent doesn't actually matter that much. Once Xavier is made, Xavier essentially belongs to the audience, and each interpretation of the show and of the character will differ in some way, large or small, from the creator's intent. 
this is the foundation of death of the author as a concept. The idea that the author's voice is lost in translation by the nature of the medium of art. As such, there is no self to Xavier as a character, because the interaction with the show means that there is no singular character, but instead thousands of different versions of Xavier, one for each audience member's interpretation. Earlier, for example, I interpreted the show as having racist stereotypes in order to make a comment on the white savior complex. By contrast, someone else could interpret that episode as being mocking Mexican people altogether, a more explicitly pro-racist agenda. We could both like that episode for totally opposite reasons, because we are both seeing two separate shows in a sense, given that our perspectives are so different. Because of this, there is no singular self of Xavier. He is fragmented into audience interpretation on an infinite number of times, leaving there no self to come back to. Whether or not this was intentional doesn't even matter, but it's still a hell of a thought. It's also worth noting that Damnesia Vu, the creator-made episode, ends with Xavier right where he began, on a stage in the same position he woke up in, suspended in limbo. In Damnesia U, it's similar, but not quite. He ends his head on the ground, licking up his own blood, again on a stage, suspended in limbo. The creators make something that is the same every time, endlessly repeating the Xavier formula from episode to episode. The fans, however, make something that is forever changed, mutilated to the point of hardly being the same at all, but only containing the same face, that of Xavier. Is this an intentional theme on the part of the creators? I honestly doubt it, but it's a nice visual metaphor nonetheless. Xavier is forever changed by audiences' inter interaction with the show, to the point of killing any notion of a self. Regardless, it's a fun episode that shows a loving relationship between the creators and their audience. The final episode mostly covers Xavier's psyche, including his desire to reunite with his mom and his principle of nonviolence. The mom stuff is mostly relevant to Xavier as a character, which we've discussed in detail, but the nonviolence stuff I think is more relevant for this video. The idea of nonviolence for Xavier is a formality. His actions still contribute to the deaths of thousands of people throughout the series, so the idea that he's nonviolent is actually somewhat meaningless, even though it's technically true. It also plays into the overarching theme of the show, which is misunderstanding a principle by accepting it on a surface level. Xavier's principle of nonviolence seems self-serving, not nearly as interested in preventing harm as he is in, prevent in pretending to have a degree of moral superiority in his refusal to directly cause harm, even though his indirect harm can be tallied up in a body Body count. The idea that Xavier is nonviolent only means anything to him, because he doesn't balance it out with any acts of preserving the well-being of others. Repeatedly, Xavier has gone into town to help others while failing to actually do so. The characters he interacts with are somewhat of a comparison and contrasting point to Xavier. Robbie, for example, is basically the opposite of Xavier, good in all the ways that Xavier is not. The rich child in Pet Suicide is sort of a mirror of Xavier. Sure, he's rich, but exactly as selfish and destructive as Xavier, just from a different starting point economically. The Chinese mobster in Xavier's maneuver is a parallel to Xavier. Savior, a bully, an intimidator, and only concerned with himself. This sort of formula of using a character to be a sort of mirror for Xavier is made much more direct in the final episode when he interacts with an actual Rorschach blot. The Rorschach blot tells him that he is anything Xavier is, that when Xavier criticizes the blot, he's really just criticizing himself. The blot is whatever Xavier wants it to be, as a reflection of his self. He is an almost literal mirror of Xavier, and he even this doesn't get through to Xavier. Xavier as a character is one completely incapable of self-reflection or introspection completely incapable of understanding that he himself is the problem. Then at the end, he actually has a literal mirror held up to his face, and he's shown how he really is, and not just how he sees himself. We then see a live action person. This scene I think is important to understand the show as a whole. How he sees himself, his self-image, is that of a pan-spiritual, pan-animal hybrid. He is new age personified. He is one with all life, and he is all life in one. This self-image, of course, is revealed to not be real, and what is real is that he's just some guy. More specifically, he's a white guy. He looks like basically the stereotypical hippie white guy, and that's kind of the point. Xavier is, at his heart, just a white guy who lifts ideas from religions and philosophies beyond his limited, Eurocentric understanding, but fails to understand these religions and philosophies because of that Eurocentric understanding, and proceeds to wear them like a fashion statement, devoid of any actual meaning, but creating the surface illusion of meaning.
There's not much more to say about the episode, but it caps off the series by letting us know who Xavier really is. Nothing more than a dumpy white guy with a savior complex and mommy issues. I guess now you could say Xavier is an ex-savior. I started this analysis back in 2011. I had plans of doing one video per episode and doing it in a series of videos, discussing Xavier as a show in depth. I lost my old account and those videos are gone, but I've always, for years, wanted to return to it. I just didn't have time and was trying to figure out a way that I could pull it off without getting banned off YouTube. So this video is six years in the making, and it's been a huge relief that I've finally been able to finish what I started so long ago. A lot has changed, and I feel like I've gotten a lot better at analysis in general. Xavier as a show was a major part of what helped spark my desire to get into analysis content on YouTube. And since I started that old series, analysis on YouTube has changed dramatically. I kind of got left in the dust of newer YouTubers who have popped up and really taken analysis videos to a new level. I'm not the originator or anything, but I've been around for a long time and I feel like I'm finally finishing what I started in a time on YouTube where what I started was so different from the landscape I now find myself in. I'm glad analysis has become more of a thing and I'm glad that in all of this time I've still had the chance to be able to make a video on this series before anyone else got around to it. I guess Xavier is sort of an overlooked classic of black comedy, satire, and surrealism. I could go on and on about how funny the show is, but I think it's better to see the show for yourself to experience it fresh. I'm so glad I got the chance to make this video, and I hope that you've all enjoyed this journey into the incoherent ramblings of a crazy person. But enough about myself, go watch the show. And as always, you can find me in the comments. You can also find me on Patreon, I guess. I have a Patreon now, so I'll put that in the description. Thanks for watching.